Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. And welcome to episode 171 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hello. This time we read His Majesty's Hope by Susan Elia McNeil, book three in the now 10 book Maggie Hope series. <laughs> wow. Wow. I really need 10 books of this. That's okay. Okay. I didn't <laughs> expect it to get that deep. Uh, this was published in 2013 by Bantam Books, an imprint of Random House. This particular copy came to us through the magnificence of the U.S. Postal System from our patron, Eastern Swiss. They asked us to read this for their Patron's Choice episode this year, and it's hard to say no when you mail us a book. Uh, you know, it's like it's already there. We don't have to find it or buy it. And then, it's, then yeah. it's just there to guilt us into reading it. So good good tactic, Eastern it Swiss. It did stare at me for like two weeks before I was like, all right, I should read this. <laughs> all right. Uh uh, Eastern Swiss had this to say about His Majesty's Hope. I got a juicy one where a British tutor becomes a spy to fight Nazis, but neglects her duties, gets her partner killed over dumb shit, and never listens to smart people. <laughs> Meanwhile, her half-sister in Germany is a dumbass who tells her Jewish best friend to fuck off so she can take care of a hot pilot in her attic. <laughs> also, she's clueless about Nazis, despite her mother being a top official with the party. Like, how can you know nothing about what's happening? It's implied that Goebbels sometimes visits her house. Like, come on, you know some shit. So, you know, we haven't, I, I don't know, have we actually never read a Nazi book before? I mean, it's a it's a book about World War II. It's not a Nazi book. That's a different thing, no, I feel I like. Mean, I mean, I, what, sorry, what I was trying to get at is that we've, <laughs> that like, we've not yet read a book featuring Nazis as like the ultimate evil, like a World War II book. I don't think we've done that yet, right? Yes, yeah. I, we have not touched that. We have not at all. Yeah, what wonderful so timing. It was yeah, it was great timing. Um, all right. So, if this is your first time listening to the Terrible Book Club, what we do here on this show is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes, like today, we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend or mail to us. So we do the opposite of what most people do when they are in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet and looking for something to read. Usually, this experiment results in a hilariously disappointing read, but once in a while, we do actually end up liking or even loving the book. Uh, in addition to our usual barnyard language, today's episode includes discussion or mention of Nazi shit. Just all the Nazi stuff. You know, Nazis, it's everything they were doing. Hey, but uh, Guys, remember Nazis? I think we've heard of them before. Yeah. Uh, but this one, this in particular is focusing on the eugenics-fueled murder of children. Uh, there's also some like prison camp talk and minor violence. Chris, would you like to read the back of the book summary? Like, what? Tell us, tell us how uh, Susan McNeil wanted to pull us in. All right. World War II has finally come home to Britain, but it takes more than nightly air raids to rattle intrepid spy and expert codebreaker Maggie Hope. Was she the codebreaker? Yeah, that is second. not at all <laughs> a story. That is a lie. Her father is an expert codebreaker. She is not. She is not okay. a codebreaker. <laughs> Right. Well, they fucked that, that up. Okay, back to this. Maybe it happened before. After serving as a secret agent to protect Princess Elizabeth at Windsor Castle, Maggie is now an elite member of the Special Operations Executive, a black ops organization designed to aid the British effort abroad. And her first assignment sends her straight into Nazi-controlled Berlin, the very heart of the German war machine. Relying on her quick wit and keen instincts, Maggie infiltrates the highest levels of Berlin society, gathering information to pass on to London headquarters. But the secrets she unveils will expose a darker, more dangerous side of the war, 
and of her own past. Thank you, Chris. Uh, would you like to tell us about the characters and the setting? Sure, we got a little bit of that in the summary. We got our main character, Maggie Hope, British spy and tutor, and I guess codebreaker, but not. Yeah, I don't know. Not in this book. We have Clara Hess, who is Maggie's German Nazi mom. I guess in the earlier books, she probably was with the codebreaker dad for a while Maybe. in the secrets, embedded or something behind British lines. And then she's like, ha ha, but I am Nazi. Uh, no, anyway, no, we also- no. What, what happened is uh, they they were in a car accident when she was really little. And the whole purpose of the car accident was to obscure Clara's death. So then she could run away to Germany because it was like part of the German plan for her to have offspring. But she didn't want to. OK, well, that seems like a dumb plan. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> then we have Elise Hess, Clara's daughter slash Maggie's half sister. You have various British intelligence agents and military personnel from Maggie's dad, Edmund, that codebreaker guy, to her current beau, Hugh, to her special division of operatives and Winston Churchill himself. So it's all the whole. Yeah, we even get like kit and a- caboodle. Alan Turing makes an appearance. He's, like, yeah, like, just up, he's up in here, too. So, yep. you know, just guest appearance by Alan Turing and Goebbels. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so various yeah. various Nazi party members are also here from lowly Hitler youth to all the way up to Goebbels. By the way. I always want to say gerbils. Gerbils. You can call him gerbils. See that name. You can call him gerbils. But yeah, I mean, it's just kind of you know, diminutive to him, which he deserves. Yeah. Um, we also have Hitler's personal physician is in here. Um, and then, of course, Hitler himself. Hitler's in here. It's yep. a World War II book. He's got to make an appearance as well. Um, we also have Gottlieb Lehrer, an embedded spy for Britain. Father Licht, a resistance organizer in Germany. And then Frida and Ernst, Elisa's friend and her Jewish husband. Yeah, that about covers all the important ones. All right, so Chris is going to take you through our plot summary. This is just so as we are talking about things we liked or didn't like about the book, you at least understand kind of the basic elements of what happened, you know, the rising action, the denouement, the, you know, the wrap up, whatever. All right, Chris, why don't you read the summary? You got it. It's 1941, and we're in the UK with Maggie Hope, who was a secretary to Winston Churchill, and then she also saved Princess Elizabeth, and now she's going to take on the Nazis as the first female ground spy. Churchill is just using her to bait her Nazi mother into defecting with all of her secrets, but Maggie thinks her mission is only to bug her mother's office. Her cover is that she's the girlfriend of a lower-level Nazi officer named Gottlieb Lehrer, so that they can get into the house during a fancy Nazi dinner party. Meanwhile, her half-sister Elise, who she doesn't know exists quite yet, is a nurse at a local hospital who has just stumbled ass-first into the beginnings of the Holocaust. <laughs> yep, just fell right in. Just, whoops. Once she figures out that the government is murdering children who aren't perfectly Aryan and healthy, she naively tries to gather intel and find a way to stop it. She ends up teaming up with a local priest who coincidentally is also teaming up with Gottlieb, completing the second everyone fucking knows everyone else circle in this book. <laughs> and there are like two more of those to come. <laughs> Anywho, Maggie's got two boyfriends. John, presumed dead. So I guess, you know, in her mind, she only has the one. Right, so, right. You know. John was shot down in enemy territory, and Hugh, another agent who she started dating when John died. Unbeknownst to her or anyone else, John was actually brought to Elise's hospital with a bunch of Germans in a case of mistaken identity, and she takes him home to hide him in her attic when she figures out that he's English because he speaks English. Also, Elise's best friend Frida is married to Ernst, a Jewish man, and Elise puts him in the attic too. Maggie completes her mission, but comes down with a nearly terminal case of hubris and stays in Germany instead of leaving as scheduled. She does find some important paperwork exposing the plans and figures for the eugenics program, but her cover gets blown within days, and she's on the run, ending up at Elise and Nazi mom's house because she trusts Elise for no reason other than that they are half-sisters. Frida betrays Elise to her mom, but this literally never matters. Oh, and Maggie had some gay friends, but they also never matter in the story. Anyway, Elise comes up with a plan to smuggle Ernst, Maggie, and John out of Germany inside large instrument cases that belong to her father's orchestra when they go to Switzerland for a performance. Nazi mom figures this out and traps them in the luggage car on the train. Maggie shoots and kills a young Nazi train attendant right as he shoots her. Her mom does end up defecting and Maggie heals up after she and everyone else is safely extracted. The secret agents and the Catholic Church team up to expose the eugenics program and child murder, strengthened by the proof that Maggie brought back from Germany. 
Maggie's hard as fuck now after killing <laughs> someone, so she keeps the bullet in her ribs. I'm <laughs> sorry, that's never not gonna be funny. Sean ends up being a fucking asshole and punching holes in the wall when he finds out that Maggie dated someone else when he was thought to be dead. He was decent, I guess, but Maggie doesn't care now that she murdered someone and needs to go teach at the secret agent school in Scotland for a while. And the that's, end. Yep, just just ends there. And I guess then there's still seven there's more seven more books, books after that. This. Why? 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 World War Two did go on for a little bit, right? Yeah, but I mean, I you know I quickly saw. The tenth book is like a spy in Hollywood. Like she like moves to the U.S. <laughs> oh, like they, they ran out of yeah, World War Two. Yes, like, yeah, I don't uh, know, man. Uh, no. She went to Hollywood now to spy on the movies. To spy on the movies. Uh, <laughs> what happens? She's just a gossip columnist. Yeah, exactly. you're that by the tenth book. Yeah, I, what a fall from grace. Is it, right, this is something. This is like when bands just like keep making albums even when they shouldn't. Like guys. Your first three were great. You're done. Stop. You don't need to keep going. I mean, you going. can even just live off the royalties, probably, so you can honestly just... You can just stop. You don't. Aren't you tired? Doesn't tour suck? It doesn't writing books and spinning up all these complicated conveniences exhaust you, dear author? <laughs> so tired. Doesn't it? I had to figure out a way to get for her from Britain to Hollywood for some reason. What, what even happened after World War II that was worth <laughs> spying on in Hollywood? Who knows? Um... I don't know. I'm sure there was some shit. Whatever. I don't care. Moving on. All right. Great. <laughs> now you all kind of know what happened in that story. Uh, Chris, what was, what was good about this? What was good about this? Okay. I think you and I are kind of divided on this we one. I are... think maybe. This is a Paris maybe... versus Chris episode. <laughs> the fight. <laughs> so, uh, listen, maybe it's all the terrible that we recently had on here yes. really warping yes. my brain. I think that's what here. happened. There, I mean, shit was really bad around these parts for a while. So this is just a popcorn spy thriller set in World War II with a high society infiltration flavor. If that sounds like your thing and you're not looking for too much depth, it's well paced. The scope is well contained until kind of the very end. And in comparison, again, comparison to a lot of the other stuff we've read this year, I find myself wanting to find out what happens next instead of begging for the torture to end. So I really, again, just got to hang my hat on that very low hat rack over here where it's like i was kind of interested to see where the plot went and that is fine sometimes that is not everything has to be you know a 10 out of 10 profound thing sometimes you want to unwind after work with your lady spy fights the nazis thing yeah i feel very different so i'm just not going to say anything for now all right what's your next point <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, we might disagree on this too, actually. I think it's good that the story bothers to give you sort of a first-hand POV witness of children being murdered by the Nazi regime. You might be like, oh, that's a little heavy-handed, but... No, I don't think so. I found World War... I, I am finding, because I haven't, like, watched some World War II based media in a while. I mean, half of it is, like, weird conspiracy shit on, like, the History Channel, yeah. which is, like... Every time you hear, by the way, Paris, whenever you hear someone's a World War II enthusiast, don't you just groan deeply inside? <laughs> yes, because it usually means they are uh, a Nazi. They're like a fascist or racist, <laughs> or they're so misinformed and uninformed about history that, you know, you worry you, you can't even have a conversation drags, with them. Is it just because it's like that's the one where it was like there's clearly the bad guys. Like it's been the most clear bad guy story we've had in recent history. So it's just well, real easy to get wrapped up in that. I mean, on the surface, but beneath the surface, it's not actually because like, yeah, of course, America like, was like level. America was ready to just let all that shit happen and not get involved uh, for most of the war. And there's, True. you know, I mean, plus like the Nazis built their you know, eugenics and racial profiling plan and kind of like societal boot crushing on America and on Jim Crow. I mean, that's actually very briefly even mentioned in this book, which which was, you know, a point in its favor. But in any case, I mean, yeah, I think I think uh, it is becoming unfortunately salient again <laughs> to indulge in media like this because of the rise, the rise again of fascism, especially in the U.S., yeah, and that's why I found this not tougher to get through, but when I got to those scenes, 
where it was like they just gas children to death and like disabled children especially. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I got to remember this kind of thing when I like am deciding whether to, I don't know, maybe I'll have to hide a friend at some point. Who kn- when that comes to Massachusetts, when it comes to Massachusetts, you know it's fucking over. But like you, <laughs> Yeah, we're done. Right, like yeah. But but honestly, it it's so, you might find it silly that I'm like, "Oh my god, I have to think about like what if I have a friend that I need to like no, Hi, that's not silly like at all. That. I mean, honestly, like I thought about you because of your vision stuff and like Exactly. Cuz they mentioned that they're murdering kids that are blind or deaf or and I was just like Yeah, it makes you think about all the people in your life who wouldn't be there if it was discovered. Or people in my life that would be like, "Ah, what's so fine if Chris ain't around." He's blind anyway. Yeah, that would be terrible. Um, I I will say, uh, before we even get into any other discussion of the book, uh, the probably the best piece of media I've seen in a long time about World War II uh, is The Man in the High Castle. It's fictional. It is an alternate history, but it's deeply personal approach to the subject is brilliant, I think. I mean, yeah, it's got some, like, It's got a little bit of dumb fantasy shit in it, but I think the performances are worth seeing. Um, Like, Rufus Sewell is just... Him in that show is, like, one of the best performances I think ever (laughs) I've seen. And just how... I don't know. I think it really gets it really gets to you. Um, you do have to sit through some annoying shit in like part of the first season. I personally think the main character kind of is annoying, but uh, it's worth watching through the end. Point being, and it's a really good kind of deeper slice than this is. This is like your real like. This isn't even the frosting. This book, Mag- the Maggie Hope book, is like the little rosettes on top of a cake. You're not even hitting that first oh, layer of frosting. Like those. Oh. I'll be honest with you. No. Are you kind of like? The- Get out of here. I will eat frosting Paris. before I eat cake. Paris, no. Like, listen. The only good parts of the cake are the part under the frosting. Oh my god. Chris, our friendship's over. Listen, That's here's it. The thing. We're done. Here's the thing. Close up the podcast <laughs> to burn all the books. It's over. That- Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your... Okay, like the part in between, like when you have like a two-layer cake, Mm -hmm. that part in between, which I know can also be frosting. Yes. I'm clear with that, but usually when it's something different that's not the frosting that's on top, that's the best kind of cake. And I, you know, you know what? This might be the type of cake that I always have for my birthday talking because boy, do they lay on that frosting thick in that one place that I've always been going for birthday cakes. Well, this is why I love your birthday because usually I can sneak a piece or two of that cake and it's great. <laughs> but anyway. Konditermeister in Quincy, Massachusetts. Go check it out yeah. if you like cakes. Konditermeister, anyway. the German cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> relevant. So that's how it's relevant to this podcast. Uh, yes. Anyway, back to what was good here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's fine and probably good that we get the, like, here. here's what happened, bro. Yeah, I think that, uh, the, so one of my points about what was good about this book was how the author seemed to do a lot of research for this, and it shows. There's like a decent attempt at immersion by referencing popular dances, music, brands, and customs of the times and places, you know, in which the story happens, and it also incorporates German language, and um, it really does a lot uh, from that from that perspective like in terms of incorporating proper and accurate historical stuff like even um we should we should mention i think it's important to say that the even though like maggie hope and elise and clara whatever are all made up um the priests who worked with gottlieb lehrer like gottlieb lehrer is was a real person i mean i think his name was slightly different it was like it was like gerald lehman or something it was like a slight difference but um, that's kind of funny considering alan turing pops up in here but you couldn't just yeah. give that guy like his spot yeah here. i didn't i thought that was a little strange but she slightly renamed him what if it was like blallin during yeah. that showed up later instead? computer guy um <laughs> But in any case, yeah, so the Gottlieb character is essentially real, and so are the priests that uh, kind of unveiled the plot. I actually didn't remember this part of World War II history, but that priest at that particular church uh, in Berlin and a few other um, cardinals who I think might have not been cardinals until after whatever, like higher up priest guys, they, you know, the Catholic Church was like, this is not cool. The wholesale murder of children 
<laughs> be, you know, murder of people who are deemed quote unquote unfit. Like they were just not down with eugenics, which like, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I, frankly, I'm kind of surprised, <laughs> but they, um, so a bunch of them took a stand and they kind of, they like distributed the same, uh, sermon to a bunch of churches. They like made public statements and wrote letters and stuff. And it culminated in actually the only time that at least is, um, noted by more than one source that people openly booed Hitler in public during this period. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Cause yeah. when that scene happened in this book, I was like that, did that happen? I don't know. That seems a little it bit. Seemed really dumb. Me, it seemed yeah. really dumb, but it was real. Um, yeah. In 1941 after like right after this had been, you know, kind of circulating in the public, he got off his train at some station in Germany. And at the same time, there was also a train loading up people to be murdered. It was part of the eugenics program. Oh. And so everyone at the station, like when confronted with this insane juxtaposition, booed him and like and really just, you know, went for it. (laughs) Mob mentality. Um, I get you know what? I got to hand it to the German people right there, because I feel like if I was in that situation, the best I would come up with is also booing. Yeah. And and so (laughs) I guess this is what I can do. Because so most of the time. That was like that wasn't happening because he literally had fucking stormtroopers and like uh, Hitler Youth and like a bunch of other I forget other um, kind of groups to very uh, roughly police people, which is shown in the book, I think, quite accurately, where you're just constantly getting stopped and asked for your papers and like no matter what you're doing. Um, But this is like the only documented case there, I mean, there is there is like some discussion that maybe during the 1936 Olympics people booed him, but I mean, there were so many people also cheering that it, it's debated. Like it was kind of like a boo urn situation. You're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> were you saying? We don't have boo? the booometer over here. No one really was taking that data right there. I was saying boo Hitler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, they, they, yeah, they question you that way when you get back home. Yeah. Like we have this this tape here. <laughs> so in any case, uh, that this scene, even though Chris and I both thought it was ridiculous, actually happened. Like Hitler really did cool. get booed you know, out of point, train station. Again, again, point in the author's favor. Yeah. they did the research. Right. So you know what? I yes, I am the stupid one that has not like done a lot of World War II research because I, you know, the general points of like don't do that shit, please, is not lost on me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and I think this is um, this is kind of a big point in the book's favor because so many sort of popcorn thriller books set in a historical time period don't don't bother to make it very historical. It's like the historical part is literally just the set dressing of like this happened during this war. I will I will say uh, the Highlander TV show is very much like this, <laughs> where uh, Duncan McLeod is. In, he's involved in every war or conflict or anything that sort of like checked a box on like a Western history list and <laughs> a knife fight in a back alley in Britain. Somehow he was there. Yeah, it's it's absolutely in. absurd. He was involved in all of them. Right, and there's like he ends up integrating with like uh, a few different like Native American groups and. Um, there's oh my like God, I didn't realize that happened oh, in the Highlander. Oh, I've only seen the Highlander movies. Oh, the show. <laughs> it's not Christopher Lambert, right? No, He's not the star, um, right? Oh my God. Christopher Lambert trying to pretend to be Native American would have been a piece to watch. No, it's um Adrian Paul, who is a martial artist, and he doesn't he's like a vampire who doesn't age. He looks almost the same now as he did thirty five years ago, which is terrifying. Because he's a Highlander. Because he's a Highlander. You're right. He's he just got the a Highlander. powers from the TV show. Mm-hmm. Uh but this is that's like a great example of bad historical fiction where the main <laughs> character Paris, is just inserted so, into <laughs> what sidebar imagine being actually immortal and they make a tv show about immortals and you're like i can do that i can act, <laughs> i can just i just won't tell them uh, yeah and you're like <laughs> and straight, just... you're like because by the time anyone finds out they'll all be dead anyway so whatever Wow, he really got like the immortal vibe down. I, I just we have to. I know he's like new and like you know he's not unproven, but like I I feel like he was immortal. <laughs> there was like an act- he just took a glass and like scratched <laughs> his arm in it yeah. for, like just to like impress us. <laughs> wow, he got stabbed right through the abdomen. He was fine the next day. That's that's <laughs> we're just not gonna think about it. Uh, it's like lightning. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, no, that would be fucking that would Queen be if is he, playing in the background. Yeah, God, oh God, can we talk about how good the fucking theme song is? All right, if y'all haven't heard the theme song for the Highlander TV show, it's Princes of the Universe by Queen, and it's fucking sick. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I I walk around my house just just like being like i am immortal da, 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 da. it's very addictive freddie mercury had like extreme rob halford energy on that one track i feel like and, well you know like that judas priest kind of like yeah and you know super powerful well and it's funny you say he had rob halford energy because there's definitely a line about like having sex with women in that song and it's very confusing <laughs> it's like why is this in here what is happening Oh, right. I guess because this is for a TV show about super masculine (laughs) sword men. (laughs) Okay. Anyway, that's the good stuff in this book, unless you had anything else to add, Paris. Oh, I was just going to say, just in terms of basics, like, it was clearly edited. As you already pointed out, the pacing was great, with one glaring exception we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, You know, the flow of events and the dialogue was all fine. It all kind of makes basic sense. It wasn't great, but it was fine. Yeah. All right. Things that were All bad. Right. Speaking of <laughs> that one pacing misstep, uh, there was a stub plot in here with two of Maggie's friends, David and Freddie, who are gay men in Britain. Um, and the subplot is essentially they get accosted for being gay. And there's a whole couple of scenes with because David gets attacked and like Freddie goes to the hospital mm-hmm. to like be with him. And there's a whole thing about David's dad seeing them kissing and like all that kind of stuff there. It largely seemed unnecessary because it didn't have any bearing on the broader plot. At all. Maybe this is like something that will come into play or was in play in the earlier books. And like you want to see what's David up to here? Yeah, right? I don't so, know, but I agree. I mean. You you your note says it was a C plot. This was like an E plot. This book already had four other things going on and then there's also just random chapters about these two and it's like every time it happened I was like why are we here? I hate this. Why are we here again? I don't care about these characters cuz they they appear so briefly that you there's I mean, I didn't even develop a connection with the main character. Never mind these like <laughs> E plot guys. Like I, I uh, yeah, it was. Not I a guess great the impression. point. I think the point is to show that Britain also had its share of bigotry, as any country still does. Right. And I don't know, maybe to sort of. Not that I'm saying it was like both sides in World War II or anything, but it was, you know, it was just making me perhaps a little point about like, well, it's not like Britain was always the good guys and everything all the time. But they but don't I ever don't... even make that point. It's just like. It's just, ha- I don't know. Just, the, I, just the, thing, the fact that it happened is the point, yeah, I think, I, right? Like, just that the fact that they were attacked in a back alley by British guys. But, like, in, but a, like, in a 325-page book, did I need 50 of those pages to be about these two? No. No, I didn't. I did not. Yeah, especially if, you, if you're trying to make that point, and I'm guessing there. I'm, I'm just completely guessing yeah. that that's the point of the inclusion there. If you're trying to make that point, and as we mentioned before, Alan Turing pops up in your book basically to just walk into a room and like hand the solution to a code problem because like you can just accept, well, Alan would have figured that out, I guess. Alan, he walks in and he's like, oh, I understand this code and just solves the issue and hands it to Maggie's dad. <laughs> so if you're going to have him in there for that one scene, why not use him to show some? Because yeah, he was right. a victim of that. So I feel like he would be have been a better opportunity. But again, I'm assuming that David and perhaps Freddy were in earlier novels and you want to keep them in there uh, just for a brief moment and be like, and this is what David was doing I, at this time. I think you make a great point. And even if David, David dated, even if David and Freddy were in the other books, they don't have to be in this one. I mean, you know, it's like they could have just brought them back in a later book. Yeah, I agree. Like, Alan Turing is the obvious choice here. If he's going to be there for a hot second to be like, and then Alan Turing solved the problem and everyone clapped, like, why not use him for more than... And all the computers clapped, too, because he programmed them to (laughs) clap because he was the first person to make a computer clap. Right. Yeah, it's really just an unfortunate... uh, Yeah, I just didn't... I didn't didn't really get the choice there. Um, This, like... Look, my biggest problem is this is like this is like the safest book we've ever read. It 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 feels like a YA book because there's zero nuance. We don't we do not get like 
the regular people being frog boiled into radicalization. We get literally Goebbels and the head of the child murder program slapping nurses in parking lots and people who have been radicalized but have no depth and we have like no investment in their characters so it doesn't matter. The reader also is never trusted to infer anything. They have to be shown it like <clears throat> kids getting gassed. Like if okay if this is like Babby's first experience with World War II historical fiction when you're like 10 or 12 fine this was fine but i thought this book was for adults so i was like a little confused because the language is like really simplistic and i just i don't know it's just a really if this is for younger readers great but that's not i think that's not what it is unless i'm wrong i don't know i could check the internet what does the internet i, I mean say? like the sort of the steaminess with maggie and certain people i felt was like i mean that's in ya fiction too yeah and YA it was fiction, and it right? was very much like be... they he inserted his penis into her outside of the sock hop in the alley like it's really that <laughs> clinical um and then there's another point where they're like they were kissing and getting very warm and taking off their clothing and then they decided they were too tired to finish the deal like it's relatable it's very, <laughs> yes relatable content um but, <laughs> that's how you know it's for adults that's the real signifier of adults. like i had work today and i we had a big dinner is it okay <laughs> dinner you just want to watch tv for a bit i am really not sure if this is uh if this is classified as ya or not i don't know is it, I mean, do we have like what is really the classification for that? Like, wh who decides? Um, I feel like you always have to have like some kind of shapeshifter or supernatural event. Like, there's got to be one of those elements in there for it to be. <laughs> no, why, that's. Truly. I mean, that's. Uh, I understand what you mean, but no, not necessarily. I'm just checking the like Amazon, like you know, it's like all the categories something is in. Why don't books have like the the video game maturity rating system? It's like, is this E for everyone? What's <laughs> this? Is, is this X? It's an X game. <laughs> That's that was E O, I believe, or A O what, was what like was the that? designation for like adults only. I believe oh. was like the only like five games ever got that. Like the one that was about uh, riding a BMX, but your character has her tits out. Oh, like that God. one game got. <laughs> Why were humans? It was called BMX XXX. Oh, I can't. <laughs> That's like the one game I remember that got an AO rating. Oh Jesus. Um, no, this is this is ranked in historical World War II fiction, espionage thrillers. I guess it's not supposed to be YA. Just I think it's for grown-ups, Paris. This is for grown-ups. It doesn't feel like it's for grown-ups though, <laughs> which is why I kind of had a problem with it. It just felt really. Yeah, really simplistic. Like the length, like it. I guess I'm trying to say that's that, what I mean when I said popcorn, right? Yeah, like, like we the, don't really get the language, too in depth. The language isn't artful. Yeah, there's really not a whole lot of depth. Um, so that was my main issue. But I guess I don't know. I guess there's plenty of adults out there who maybe haven't engaged with this topic. Like I said, Chris and I both learned things from it. So. Yeah, I guess it's it's not the worst thing in the world. It's just not, you know, if we're talking about our experience reading the book and if we liked it or not as individuals, I I didn't love that. I wanted more from the book in terms of both language and sort of depth of character and, and kind of emotional internal struggle. It, it definitely lacked that for me. Um, do we want to move into, like, plot stuff that was kind of weird or just character behavior that was kind of weird? Sure. I mean, that seems to be the next best section for us. All right. So you may remember from our brief plot summary that Chris read earlier that there was a line saying Frida, Elise's friend who is married to the Jewish man, betrays Elise to Elise's evil Nazi mom. And that I I cannot explain why that was even in the book, because it's there for about two pages. It literally never matters because... Uh, Frida tells Clara, like, oh, I know Elise is hiding people in the attic. And if I, you know, if I tell you this, then you have to promise to save my husband or whatever. And Clara's like, oh, yeah, whatever, sure. But then Clara defects and doesn't do anything with that information. So it just dies before it even goes anywhere. So, like, the inclusion of it, I question. Why? Why add this needless layer, especially when Frida has no reason to betray her friend 
And the the wor- okay, the the worst part about this whole thing is not even that it doesn't matter and that like the motivations are questionable for the character, but that um Frida is like Elise is so naive. I I can't believe she thinks she's going to be able to do anything to solve this. Like they're killing German children, whatever. And then, like, a few hours later, she's like, okay, so if I tell the evil Nazi what I know about someone hiding two random insignificant people, they'll totally let my Jewish husband live, right? And fuck my friend who has helped me a bunch of times. Like, I... She's like, oh, she's so naive. And then she goes and does an extremely naive thing. Like, (laughs) if you think Nazis are the ultimate evil, why would you think that they would bargain with you for the life of your Jewish husband because you know about two people in an attic like those people it's not like it's the president of the united states in the fucking attic like it's just two (laughs) people who aren't that important i that whole thing i don't know did you feel similarly about this yeah i mean so when eastern swiss gave their sort of reasoning for um why they wanted us to read this book and they said her half sister in germany's dumbass and who tells her jewish best friend to fuck off so she can take care of a hot pilot in the attic i kind of disagree with that sentiment a little bit because at least does take does take in the friend and honestly like there is a little bit of she's not like i don't want to take it she's like it would be risky for me to do that i don't know if i can do that at first frida just wants at least to talk to clara and she does try to see if they can get and she does so i don't like really i don't think there is like the sentiment of like fuck off i'm gonna take care of the top because also elise like d- like he's wrapped in bandages the whole time too yeah <laughs> i never it, right? i like, never get the sense that she's like mm, i'm gonna i'm gonna rescue this pilot and then fuck him like i do not get that sense at all not once so, so I get, the point i'm trying to really make here is that like Similar to you, I agree that I don't understand why Frida would make the leap to be like, oh, if I tell Clara about these two people, they'll save my husband. Why? You know, you don't have any more leverage after that. Like, you got to slow burn that or like tell like tell Clara that at least is up to something. And I can tell you if you smuggle me and my husband out of the fucking country or something, right? Like yeah, you gotta. Yeah, it, it just. But like, so even so, it it doesn't make sense from a from a character motivation perspective from what we know about the character, and then it just doesn't matter in the story. So I don't understand why. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the story that end up not mattering. So uh, is this a good segue into Clara's evil plan? Oh. <laughs> That also didn't matter. Oh my god! Yeah, it's pretty stupid. We barely um, mentioned this in the summary. So yeah, let, so Clara has an evil plan yes. to poison the British water supply. She has agents in place in Britain. Well, she thinks she does, and that's why she thinks she does. She thinks she, you know, she and they are going to poison the British water supply, and that's going to get her favor with gerbils and Hitler gerbils. and all of those <laughs> fellas there. Yeah, just a massive her shambling evil plan. gerbils <laughs> squeaking and yes, shrieking the, and pooping. The perfect Aryan. <laughs> so anyway, her plan is to poison the British water supply again with fluoride. 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 Not fan like fluoride with like a different, just, that's just the sodium same fluoride, fucking fluoride. Just sodium fluoride. It's already yep. in there and it's not like she's like even doing like a lot of it i think she, it's because you gotta do a lot of fluoride for it to be a problem okay, right yeah so i'm all right so this is this is we're returning to a segment we like to call paris tries to do math and <laughs> this is paris tries to do chemistry math i i clung to a b desperately in organic chemistry in high school i got a d I, oh, so shit. i'm definitely not qualified no, to talk I am, about this i mean that b was uh, a weighted b because the whole class was <laughs> so bad so uh, i probably also got a d in chemistry uh, secretly um so but like i was just like all right let me figure out what's the lethal dose of sodium fluoride because the book is specific it does say sodium fluoride it doesn't provide you know a different form and i'm like all right what are the levels of like What are, like, the levels of toxicity? Like, because she doesn't even want to do it to kill them, right? Does she? No, No. it's not like she's like, I'll poison them all and then, like, we'll be rid of a lot of British people. It's just like, I'm just going to poison them in general and that'll probably fuck things up for a bit. Okay, so, right. So, like, a lethal dose of sodium fluoride is about 5 to 10 grams for an adult. It produces gastrointestinal discomfort, like, 15 to 20 times lower than that. So you're talking, like... 0.2 0.2 to 0.3 milligrams or something 
And so I, like, so she was, what, gonna, like, make everyone shit a lot for a couple days until the water supply ran through the floor? My like? evil Nazi like, diarrhea plan. <laughs> sorry, we. I, I should say, drinking water has 0.5, so half to one milligram per liter for tooth hygiene. So that's like not a lot. I guess it can it can produce discomfort at like several times over that. Like you'd have to go like 15 times that to produce any sort of like You're like standing over problems. the British water supply thing with like barrels and barrels and barrels of I guess pure sodium fluoride yeah. just like shaking it in there like I guess this will be enough. <laughs> well, so that that's across the, multiple it, like yeah. right like you have to get it into so many spots. So they said that they were going to poison nine municipalities. And like if you think about how many people lived in like if, if London or Manchester or like Birmingham, you know, any any sort of large city, I'm thinking like to kill people you would need a hundred bill a billion grams i don't know like to like be a clear lot? even in the book clara is like i'm not even sure what this is gonna do but it'll probably do something and like in the end it's probably like she probably just gave him enough to have stronger teeth there's some kind of <laughs> british teeth joke yeah, in here yeah or something but like why would you make your master villainess's master plan also stupid and not matter and probably benefit people a little bit if it's pulled off yeah i was confused by that too i mean and there's always i mean and this is like there there were there are like um there's a common rumor that like oh nazis use fluoride to control people's minds in the war they did not that is a myth that did not happen fluoride does not produce mind control um there are negative effects of fluorosis like when your body takes in too much fluoride over time but it makes your like bones disintegrate which is terrible um so it's not great but like it's not gonna make you a puppet and also it takes <laughs> a fuck ton of fluoride to produce that level of um, Is that what the harm. dentist is doing to me all the time? <laughs> is that, is that yes. like, coming back out there and I'm like, I must floss for two days and then stop immediately after. <laughs> Chris, it sounds like you need fluorosis. It sounds like you actually need <laughs> a heavy dose of fluoride. Um, But in any case, yeah, we were talking about like how, why did she think that anyone could transport and deploy that much sodium fluoride in nine different locations in, in i just i don't even know so you'd have to fly in big ass planes full of sodium <laughs> fluoride and then like hope that you hit the water tank when it was open i don't it just feels like and like you said for what for what to make people poop a little bit more like i like the british are like you're literally bombing us from the sky and she's like ah but what if we were also giving you diarrhea i mean i guess i guess <laughs> that does suck it's more. not great right like I, I would not like to be in both scenarios at the same time in fact if i had to choose one it would be the diarrhea probably <laughs> yeah. and like being bombed and having diarrhea sounds like a terrible time <laughs> yes but i imagine that the water supply like the water supply would like flush itself out in a matter of a couple of days. I mean, maybe I'm incorrect about that, but I just, this whole thing, yeah, I'm like, I don't get why this It's like her brilliant choice. plan to, like, gain favor with, like, Hitler himself. And well, and shit. after she had already fucked up twice, I forget what she had done twice before, but she had, she had kind of, she was kind of already, like, on the outs, and she was like, ah, oh, yes, I must do one great final plot to be the ultimate Nazi, blah, ha, ha. And then it's this, and you're like, what? <laughs> They'll all shit I, themselves. Very like, briefly, eh, for clearly, just maybe two days. Change your clothes, and you're fine. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I and I'm also confused as to why the author made this choice. That's what I mean. Like, like why, why? Why would this be the evil plan? Like, Shouldn't yeah, there be, it's like, like whether the author or the character's motivations, like neither of them make sense. And I, I just I don't get it. Is this another case where they're like there was a stupid Nazi diarrhea fluoride plan <laughs> in <laughs> history? And we're like, why would you do that? That's stupid. And then she <laughs> is just more well researched than us. I don't think so, because I really don't. No, because the myth, the, because the idea that Nazis used fluoride during the war was a myth. It's a popular myth. It's not true at all. So this almost feels like you're sort of perpetuating the idea that Nazis used fluoride when that wasn't true. I, man, it just, it made me laugh when I read it too. I was like, this is yeah. so dumb. I just, <laughs> what? 
Okay, so that's, again, part of things just generally not making sense and being questionable from a perspective of imagining the author writing this and being like, yeah, that's the choice I'm going to make. There's another, like, major thing that we hated, we both hated about this book is everyone being related or knowing each other conveniently in everywhere you fucking turn. Like, Maggie's, it's Maggie's mom or her sister or her dad, and then it's like her half-sister is, like, rescuing her boyfriend, and it's just, I, I can't... I can't handle this. It ruins the scope of things that have like yeah. a bigger scope. Like, right? Like, if we're if you're ta- starting to get things into the higher levels of like Nazi hierarchy and stuff like that, just always bringing it back down to this very personal level feels incongruent to me. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to do a story that involves these higher ups, you probably want to involve like a lot of disparate people from different social circles and functions within both Britain and Germany at the same time. So when you kind of make it like, oh, it's kind of like this one family that's at the center of everything, it really dilutes it. If you want to focus on one family, you kind of have to remove it, I think, from the super high stakes stuff like that has to be affecting them instead of like them being in the middle. Right. Like what are, I just think about it. You have Maggie who worked for Winston Churchill and saved princess Elizabeth. And then her dad is a notable British codebreaker spy. Her mom is a notable super high up Nazi, like sort of cultural officer. She's an opera singer, which I think we forgot to mention. And then her half sister is the one who saves her British boyfriend who was downed in Germany and happens to be at that hospital and not found out. I mean, and then like Elise, all, the half sister also happens to be the one to like stumble onto the eugenics program that they're all trying to stop. I mean, fuck off. Even like, Gottlieb Lehrer, her like fake boyfriend for her cover, he ends up also being involved with like Elise and the church and and it's just fuck off, fuck right off. I hate this. I finally I think I've coined the term that we're gonna use for this moving forward, Paris. This is plot nepotism, is what this is. <laughs> plot nepotism. Just keep getting family members involved in the well, shit family... because I mean you already had your foot in the plot door. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like family members or just people you know, somehow they're all involved in this massive wartime spy conspiracy thing, and it just sucks. Like, it just it makes me fucking roll my eyes. It makes me not care. And it really, to be honest, takes me away from the historical stuff because all of the characterizations and the plot nepotism is happening it makes me feel like, well, none of this has to be real, which is, I think, why Chris and I were like, no one booed Hitler. That can't be real. Because, like, <laughs> because all of the trappings of how the people know each other and are connected seem so fake that it makes you doubt the actual historical facts in the book, which sucks. That's not how I want it to be. I want to trust the historical facts because the author clearly put a lot of time and energy and effort into researching and integrating the stuff in, but then it just doesn't really stand upright atop the plot nepotism, as you put it. Like, (laughs) it's kind of wibbly-wobbly, and it just makes me go, eh, I don't really care about this. And, Yeah. yeah, it's so unbelievable and stupid. I don't understand the motivation. Like, I'm sure this author could have written a book where that was not the case. Why? Why do this? And again, you could also just make it like people that you are friends with or, you know, because certainly, especially I think I only mildly disagree with you on some of that resistance stuff where it's like, oh, Gottlieb is also involved with the priests and everything. An underground resistance well, that like that lives no, and dies Gottlieb, based on its like connection. Gottlieb stuff, being, right? yeah, so. Gottlieb being involved with the church makes sense. I think what doesn't make sense is Elise stumbling into that and being like, oh, I guess we're ah, all involved in this. It's like, what are the chances that Maggie's cover True. would also be involved in the same church underground movement that her half sister is while her half sister is okay. also rescuing her boyfriend? <laughs> like, that's what I meant. Okay, understood. Yeah, yeah. Yes, fine. Because I was about to make a point about like, well, a res- you know, underground resistance does live and die by like the small perhaps network of course yeah and like a lot of people will be like in these different and i enjoy that about a kind like some stories when it's like a lot of people coming together but as you clarified just now no it's more about elisa's involvement happening to be there and also involved in the maggie (sighs) plot at the same time yeah it's it's ridiculous um i yeah i i hate it i hate it it made me it really was like a huge this is like a very large point 
uh, against this book for me. I just found it. Especially absurd. when Elise doesn't find out about the Holocaust because of the involvement with her mom. She stumbles into it, like investigating some weirdness at her hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a good way for us to talk about Eastern Swiss's point when they wrote in asking us to read this is that, yeah, like how the fuck does Elise not know anything when like Goebbels and her mom are having an affair probably and like he's always at the house hanging out and they're always having these na- Nazi dinner parties where they're like, yeah, fuck the Jews and shit. And it's like, you're not going to, you're going to tell me that no one was like, by the way, we're murdering people like the eugenics program. I just, yeah, I find that hard to believe as well that Same. that would not have come up at some point. They definitely weren't hiding it even in the book. No. Like, Goebbels was walking around and be like, we really got them now. Like, you know, <laughs> it's moving forward. And Elise would, would never have like piped up like, what are you talking about? Yeah, and I don't really see how you wouldn't connect the dots because the one of the big parts of, you know, the Third Reich was we want to make the race pure. You know, not that obviously I'm not endorsing any of this, but this is like, this was their really viewpoint. Really top billing with the third right. Yeah, they were like, yep, you got to be like healthy and strong and then real white and blonde or brown haired and blue eyed or something. And it was very obvious that like, if you were, I don't even want to say disabled, if you just weren't, ex- if you weren't like, whatever the pinnacle of health and perfection they thought you were, um, whether it was because you were blind or deaf or had a disability or, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe you honestly just, your hips weren't formed the right way. So you couldn't give birth to children. Like all anyone was considered lesser. And I, and like, you know, you weren't able to have like certain jobs or whatever. So I don't get why. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me that by 1941, (laughs) Like this is this is mm-hmm. deep in like H- Hitler was elected in 33. Right. Is that right? I think it was 33. And before that, you know, this movement was gaining steam. So you're like, you're pretty deep in at this point. <laughs> like if you don't realize that yeah. we're murdering people and again, it's, for being it's different. It's very top billing on all their party materials and things like that. And I just don't see how we... I guess it makes me feel the same way as when I hear a certain type of person that really is like, oh, all these types of people should just move away and, you know, figure it out somewhere else, not around here. Like, where do you think that's going to (laughs) end? Yeah. Do you really think do you really think that they'll just leave naturally and you won't have to deal with them? It's going to end in murder. Yeah, there's really no world where. Oh, they just need to go somewhere else doesn't end in yeah, in I genocide. just want to live and let live. Like that do you, have you considered the just the logistics of picking up your whole life and moving away? Now compound that a few million times. Yeah. And you won't don't see how there there might be some long-term effects that you had not considered or possible ways to get people to leave that you hadn't considered? <laughs> yep. Not great. Uh yeah. So the fact that Elise is like, I had no idea, and then just like literally falls ass backwards into, you know, into the Holocaust at her hospital is is bizarre. Yeah. I. Um. Another thing that sucked about this book was uh, Maggie. She. Uh, <laughs> she's. She's not. She's. Yeah, real... She's fine, but like. <laughs> she gets lucky that her gamble pays off, and she's like. Like, don't fucking reward her for her shitty boneheaded plan. Like, she was supposed to get dropped into Germany, bug her mom's office, and then get the fuck out of there literally the next day. She's like, I'm going to stay and become Goebbels secretary. And it's like, dude, what the fuck? Like, you don't, (laughs) like, your cover is going to so easily be blown because as is. It is a thin cover at best, too, right? Yeah, it's a veneer. Um especially because like as as demonstrated even in the book the nazis kept extremely exacting records so like her cover of oh i met gottlieb in rome when i was his secretary like while he was there if anyone had checked one file they would have known that that was not true because they would have known who was assigned to be his secretary when he went to rome like so I don't know, like, she, so she goes to the inner, so I should back up a little bit. 
when they're at the fancy Nazi party at her Nazi mom's house, you know, when they're supposed to like figure out a way to get the microphone in her office, um, they end up meeting Goebbels and go and was going there too. I forget. There was like a bunch of high end Nazi people and they're talking and like, he takes a liking to her or somebody takes a liking to her and is like, Oh, he's looking, he's going to be looking for a secretary. Like, why don't you interview? I forget if it's Goebbels himself or somebody else. She takes his card. And then that's what she's, she like decides later that night. Like I'm going to do it. I'm going to interview for this job. And it's like, what do you Godly think this whole time is like what the, the fuck? fuck are you talking about yeah he's like look man they're going to kill me by the way they kill him <laughs> yeah later. so she so you know Gottlieb who is who has been an agent an undercover agent from far longer this is Maggie's first mission FYI he has been an agent for far longer. He's like, absolutely not. You don't deter from the plan. You stick to the fucking plan because when you don't stick to the plan, it like because communication is so difficult, like diverting from the plan should only happen if it is absolutely necessary. It is not absolutely necessary. She has nothing to go on. She's just like, oh, if I become a secretary, then I'll have access to cool stuff. And it's like, lady, the second they check your papers at that interview, you're going to be done because your papers won't hold up to scrutiny. They'll hold up for like, you know, a casual check on the street, but not for a job in the Nazi party. Like, are you fucking dumb? And so Gottlieb's like, you can't do this. She's like, well, you can't tell me what to do. I'm my own woman. Don't mansplain yeah. spying to yeah. me. <laughs> and it's just like, oh God. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, you're going to get both of us killed. And she's like, whatever. I do what I want. I'm a strong female <laughs> character. And then <laughs> she fucking goes to the interview. Luckily, she bombs the interview because it involves typing on a German typewriter. And like, she obviously. <laughs> she didn't really. Yeah. You really didn't fucking take that one through. Like, <laughs> what is she? Pretty hilarious. Actually. Like, oh, I'll just type in English. Oh, shit. I, I actually thought that was a great inclusion of like how fucking dumb this plan was. Um, because, you know, she can speak German with. Uh, you know just not she she excuses the accent by saying she grew up in switzerland or belgium or something they speak wacky fucking german in those places more on that at a later time um anyway she speaks german fluent well enough to get by um but she yeah fails to remember that she's gonna have to type on the German keyboard she fucking fails the interview so they don't even check her papers because she failed step one like before they even check your papers they want to make sure you can actually type which to their credit yeah good system makes sense so <laughs> um she leaves without getting her papers checked uh and then i don't remember how but she's like well that didn't work i'm gonna find another way to stay here and i i she becomes secretary for the other guy. Oh, she bumps into him after she flunks the... Right. So she's at the Nazi, whatever, main building in Berlin. Nazi job interview. Nazi job that, interview. She leaves. She, she fails the typing test. And she's as she's leaving, she runs into a different Nazi guy that she also met at that party. And he's like, you know, hey, what are you doing here? And she's like, oh, I flunked out of this job interview. And he's like, oh, that's too bad. He's like, oh, does that mean you're free? Like, could you work for me maybe? And she's like, uh, and he's like, yeah, my daughter needs a companion. And she's like, okay. She's like, yeah, I've, I've taken care of kids before. That's cool. And he's like, great. So she accepts the job, rolls up to his house and like realizes that his daughter is actually a pregnant adult woman. And he just like kind of <laughs> doesn't want to be a dad and fucking hates dealing with it. And he's like, yeah, she's pregnant out of wedlock. I don't want her like seen by anyone. Can you just talk to her and like read to her? And she's like, uh, I guess. And so then, of course, he like obviously his his real intention here is to bone down with maggie um but maggie is a shitty spy and she doesn't bone down with him for more information which is what she should have done <laughs> like yeah meanwhile like again if you're really a deep undercover like that that is like thing one to do yep. like, right like <laughs> if the americans is any <laughs> it's any no it's just a tv show but um, i thought you were gonna say like that's the american thing to no. do is fuck for information <laughs> i mean yes it's it's the american thing to do it's also the uh american <laughs> right. tv show thing to do if you want to be a true patriot no but seriously sex is sex and fake relationships are used in spying it is a component that's spy 101 yeah I feel it like. is a that's... component to to spy craft and so when she turns him down i was like damn bitch you're gonna die but then <laughs> <laughs> but then she 
actually, it turned out to be the right decision because then she she's like, oh, I have menstrual cramps. And he's like, oh, I'm a man. I'm scared of <laughs> blood, I guess. And so I'm a Nazi officer. Ew. Um, and so... <laughs> She goes up to her bedroom and, like, immediately dis- tries to disguise herself and, like, jumps out the window and runs down the road. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess and then, when your plan was that naive to begin yeah, with, that's probably as bad yeah, as, good as you can it, get for an escape route as well. It's true. And then, like, moments after she's run away, like, an SS van, like, pulls in the driveway because, obviously, people found out about her shitty cover story not being real. I like real. to imagine that the dude just, like, after he, she turned him down, he just called the <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was like she didn't even fuck me can you just come here and they're like yeah i'll be right over man <laughs> like uh um yeah so i guess i well, i guess in that case it was good that she didn't have sex with him because she would have been caught or whatever but honestly she should have been caught this whole side plot like the fact that the author rewards her with just allowing her to constantly escape and get away with stuff sucks. Like, she should have been captured, and that would have been more interesting. It would have been more interesting. Like, the fact that she just keeps getting away with stuff and is fine on her first mission when she detours from the mission and, like, does all this crazy shit. I I just... It makes me so mad. And then, as you pointed out at the top of this discussion point... She does get Gottlieb killed. He fucking gets raided by the SS and he shoots himself. And he is Catholic, by the way, which is like a big point made in the book. So, uh, yeah, good job, dumbass. And like, there is no discussion about how she directly caused him to be fucking murdered or to take she his own life. guilt for one paragraph, yeah. I believe. For about two sentences. And that's it? That's the price she has to pay for fucking up is like a little bit of that. She's more guilty about the person she directly shot yeah the kid that she shot that was a nazi like a member of the nazi party like she somehow feels more guilt above that aside from getting the like clutch spy that's been in there for like almost a decade or something (laughs) yeah this guy's been spying for a couple years now and she ends up getting him murdered and his cover blown which is also shitty because that could also mean blowing the cover of everybody else in that ring he was a part of, including Elise and the priest. And, you know, that I mean, that priest actually does end up getting rounded up and dies on the way to uh, Dukau. Is that, was that, is that one of the, I think yeah. So, yes. And that, that is actually truly what happened. I don't know. A part of me is like, well, yeah, you obviously you need to have some things going wrong in Spycraft, but like the main character always getting away with everything, even though it's her first mission and she's like 20 sucks. Like, I, I don't think... I, I, I think it makes it makes everything feel like there are no real stakes because you're like, oh, she's always going to be fine. Everyone she cares about is going to be fine. The only re- the only reason Gottlieb dies in the story is because she didn't she and Gottlieb didn't really get along very well. And, yeah, and they weren't friends. Honestly, and that was why <laughs> I think. Um, let's see. Do we do we got anything else here before we close out How about the code? Knitting? Oh, the code I mean, knitting. I, I feel like. All right. So this is certainly a thing. Yeah, right? they're, they're, I'm, I'm sure perhaps there's a way to do this. Yeah, there is um there is a tradition of knitting Morse code and other types of code um among spies supposedly according to brief internet articles I read. So this is a real thing, but like the amount of information that Maggie was supposed to be conveying via Morse code in the book is absurd. Like there were whole, there was like two whole long sentences. And I was like, there is no way you knit that in Morse code into some scarf or something next to an old lady in a park because you would have had to, I mean, Morse code is dots and dashes for every letter. There's a series of dots and dashes. So like, how would you have written out those two enormous sentences? She would have been there for eight hours fucking knit until, until <laughs> dusk. Like, I, I get, I get some, you know, I get doing like a couple of words, sure, but yes, what was or like just a simple yes, no, yeah, or like you or know, like a direction, a town, like this person go here or something, and I think it is cool, but yeah, the amount of information as conveyed through the book was a little, it just made me go like that doesn't really make sense. I don't know if it was necessarily Morse yes, code it was. in the. It was okay. Yeah. I thought they had some like unique knitting cipher that only that that was the only uh, way I could explain I like how she got two sentences. I don't think out. so. Hang on a second. I can check. I have the book. 
Yeah, now she called upon her memory of Morse code to alternate knitted stitches with pearls and drop stitches. Translated. All right. Read, mission accomplished. Staying in Berlin. Great opportunity. We'll know more by Monday night. That is a lot. That's a lot of Morse code. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot in Morse code. Um, meanwhile, like the lady knits back affirmative, which is fine. Like that's, but like, yeah. But like mission accomplished, staying in Berlin, great opportunity. We'll know more by Monday night. That is so many words, even whether German <laughs> or English. Like I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how fast you can knit. Maybe there's like a really, really fast way to do that, and you could maybe do it in an hour. But that seems tedious when you could just boil it down even further. Yeah, I mean, and especially because Maggie was like, "Yeah, I can knit. I'm not great, but I can do it." And it's like. Yeah, she's explicitly not right. like the world's best. She's knitter. not a speed knitter. She's not, the, you know, that yeah. Finnish competition where you're like trying to knit while heavy metal plays behind you or something. What is that called again? Yeah, of course we all know about that, Paris. <laughs> Forget <laughs> it's a thing. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, it seemed like they maybe, yeah, like it could have just been a couple of words and not like three whole sentences. <laughs> it is just far fetched. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense, especially when. They get approached while they're sitting there knitting by SS. I don't know SS or you know whatever. Uh, I'm not sure Hitler Youth. I think whatever the whatever the you know the rotating Hitler Ghoul Squadron of the day is. Um, yes, and they even get approached while they're there. So it's like if you know you're going to constantly get you know hassled like why sit there why sit there for any longer than you have to i guess is the point but yeah i don't know i guess i guess uh morse code knitting is a real thing real thing all right well paris do we have anything else to add um there are just a couple of stupid things we we kind of laughed a little bit about leave the bullet in uh at the end like <laughs> maggie everyone's like yo you really should get that bullet out of like where your rib is and she's like no i have to have it as a reminder it's like no you don't fucking take the bullet out don't you're gonna like that's someone that says that like day one of like after they're still on the morphine right and they're like i'm fine i don't feel nothing i'll leave it in. and then like a week later they're probably like take the, yeah take yeah, the yeah bullet it's out. not gonna be good I, but that just seemed like a really <laughs> stupid thing like i don't know it just made it it just added an element of lameness to a book that i already felt was like teetering on the edge of lame um Second thing that was just kind of random was I can't believe how much of an asshole John was because, okay, they talk about how Maggie's first boyfriend, who she really loved, like died. You know, he was shot down um, it, it, right right at the beginning of the book and how sad it was because they had been it seemed like they had been together for a while. And like she went to the funeral with his family and how hard it was for her to move on. And then when they're like reunited after they get back and everything and they're like, you know, they're kissing and then that's when they realize like, oh, we're a little too tired for this right now. Um, But then she, the next day, she's like, oh, I got to tell him that I like dated someone else while I thought he was dead. And he flips out because he was like, I can't believe like basically he says like, I want our first time to be good. And you're like, wait a second you never fucked y'all never fucked <laughs> how long were you dating and like i can't believe that this john guy was like i have a claim on this woman you guys never even consummated the relationship like again not that everyone has to be that way but it's clear in this book that like that's you know we're working under these kind of regular ass um constructs here of relationships and i just like blew my mind that she was so broken up over this guy and they had dated for so long and she was like close to this family but they'd never fucked and i was like what but then the guy that she dates while you know after john dies in her mind she several months later starts dating hugh and like she and hugh have had sex numerous times and i'm like okay then what the fuck then like so I yeah don't... you didn't have a problem with it It wasn't like some kind of like i like to i want to save yeah. myself for marriage purity thing i don't know made no sense um also sucked that <laughs> yeah I think... that john was like that <laughs> yeah, was like an asshole. Say... he literally punches holes in the wall when he finds out that she slept with someone else and it's like bro everyone thought you were dead like it was very clear that your plane got shot down in enemy territory like what you really he's like i waited come back he was like i waited for you it's like yeah it's not like you had a lot of opportunities to fuck ladies <laughs> when you were dying in a german field and then in a hospital convalescing and barely aware of your surroundings as you were for half of this book like i <laughs> fuck off man 
I yeah, it that's that's really a strange turn because like I was trying to operate from like okay, it's like the 1940s and perhaps people have right, you know right. a little bit more sort of reserved about that, but you're right that she it's not a problem with her and Hugh. So no, and I actually, I, I, can't I actually think there was a pretty healthy depiction too of Elise, who we didn't talk about this because it didn't matter to the story. But Elise actually wants to become a nun, but before she's like, she's like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it like after the war's over. But she's like, yeah, but you know, before I'm a nun, I was looking to fuck dudes, and like that's when she and her friend are like in the alleyway next to the <laughs> jazz club, and it's like he pulled his penis out, and they they did it against the wall or whatever it says. Um, <laughs> so yeah on top of that okay john you're leaving to fly a plane in war <laughs> yes in a war you're leaving here's your girlfriend you've been dating with for a while you don't want to tr- right there that's your opportunity right there perhaps yeah really surprised they didn't they didn't get that done before he left. So it's a real shame. Um, but maybe it's... Was he tired all the time beforehand? Is this a recurring I thing? I don't know. But uh, anyway, just that fact and his response was just really confusing. Um, I don't know. And then the, the and then keeping on, on, the, on the John train here. Okay, so he is a British pilot, gets shot down in German territory, but somehow he gets rescued as a German. And like... So did all of his clothes blow off? <laughs> like, was he so I far guess. away from his plane that they didn't know he was British? Did he not have British dog tags on? Like, I'm just trying to piece this together and I don't quite understand <laughs> how no one knew he was British. It doesn't say, like, he's extra burnt, too. Right? Like, like, if he was, like, very burnt, like, perhaps, like, his clothes really did come off. And, like, then he couldn't talk for a while. He was, I mean, I guess he just shut the fuck up. He I mean, was so, If they're saving you, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't speak up and be like, I'm English. Right. And, like, get, <laughs> immediately get killed right there. So, like, to be clear, I'm not, my beef isn't there. <laughs> it's just that how does he not get identified you're right his insignias or anything identified must have been burned away he must have been and he was injured so he didn't throw it off right so like he was i mean it seems like he was pretty seriously injured too they don't really get into any details about what happened but he was pretty seriously injured because he was like not really with it for weeks and and you know and on morphine and stuff so clearly his injuries were pretty extensive but yeah so he would have had to been found like nowhere near his plane uh his dog tags would have had to be ripped off his clothing would have to be have been gone uh, so i don't so he was naked i mean what you don't field? know is that he, like... yeah he likes to fly nude he's a <laughs> I mean, he's a birthday suit <laughs> yeah so like all of that is it's just not comfortable i just chafe all the time I, if yeah. i'm not like I, I you don't understand so... i know these world war ii planes have like an open canopy but i'm fine up there <laughs> yeah like nude flying is the only i mean of course you know of course dog tags can like get caught and ripped off but i i guess this is another case where it's like so many things would have had to line up for this to have happened and i uh... i mean just give me a line when he like finally regains consciousness that he's like yeah i threw my clothes away and i, I had just enough energy to like stumble away and then i succumbed to my injury yeah or or like um, I was already wearing a German suit because I was, you know, like if he was also a spy, it would have made more sense if he was like, oh, I was already in like German outfit in a German plane because I was like a spy. Then that would have made plenty more sense. <laughs> I <don't, laughs> like I, I just I don't know. I really had a hard time with that part. Um, l- lastly, uh, I'm just going to say this last thing that I found kind of bizarre in the book. It actually made me wonder if the author was a man. Um, at the very beginning of the book, when we're first introduced to Elise and Frida, they both are nurses at this hospital in Berlin. And the scene is them starting their shifts. And for some reason, they're like changing to the point of nudity <laughs> into their nursing outfit. It is, you know, European and over there. They're, they look more comfortable and less uptight than we no, are. but, like, why you gotta change to the point of nudity to get into your work scrubs? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why you gotta take Once all... Once again, the- they like to nurse nude. Guess- it's really <laughs> just... <laughs> yeah, I guess n- they're, everyone's a nudist in this book and everything just makes a lot more sense. Um, And so they're changing and they're like, Hitler booed while naked. Yeah. 
<laughs> so anyway, our first glimpse into Elise and Frida's friendship is them changing into their work clothes at work, I guess before their shift start, which is also kind of strange. And they... Nurses do and that. Like, I don't know. I always see... I know nurses personally. I always see them going in in their scrubs. So I don't know. That seems There's got to be some that do it yeah, on maybe, the job. Maybe but... fine. Which is fine. But, but anyway, this this isn't really the point of my issue. My issue is... I just, I'm just trying to cut off the um actually comments underneath the yeah. YouTube upload. That's yeah. all I'm doing. Frida is like, oh, man, your boobs are so great. Like, she's talking about how much she loves Elise's boobs. And I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of funny. That's kind of strange. I was like, well, it's not the most unheard of thing. Like, sure, you know, if you're if you're European and nude, I, I'm sure Europeans talk about each other's body parts. It doesn't seem that weird. But it was like a little bit of a weird thing to put in the book. And then a few sentences later... <laughs> They slap each other on the ass before their shifts. And I'm like, okay, who is this scene for? Like, like, <laughs> why was this like this? I honestly felt that way, too. I thought, like, oh, are they, like, involved in a relationship? And that's going to be that's kind of what I thought. Story. Like, Elise is, like, being persecuted for, for her that's like, what I proclivities thought or something. But no, no, no. It's just, like, this one-off random, like, wow, we're hot nurses. Like, it <laughs> felt like the start of a porno. Yes, I heard. I got to be honest I heard the you. porno music behind me, like, starting. And I was like... <laughs> Why is this opening like this? This is really strange. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, really questionable, sort of a questionable um, combination of things, right? If any one of those things had happened on their own, I wouldn't be. It wouldn't be as like I, I'm like as uh you know. Are we about to? Start? What do you mean? You don't compliment your friend's boobs and slap each other on the no. butt all the time? No, I don't. Before work shifts, I don't because that's. I, I mean, I guess if you and your friend have already established that that's things you do, fine. But sure, I, again, just that, in the that can be ha be happening in a friendship, but it's just you're right, <laughs> a little off. like in the context of this book too. That's like so sanitized for all the other kind of romance and sex stuff. It was really odd to have it just start with like two naked nurses talking about their boobs and slapping each other on the ass. <laughs> like okay. <laughs> All right, Susan McNeil, if that is your yeah, real yeah, name. Yeah, I really hear, like, the wah-wah guitar and, like, the loud bass, yeah. like, turning up slowly. <laughs> so, um, just, a, just a scene. So, funnily enough, Chris, I had the same thought. I was like, oh, Elise is gay. Elise and Frida are, like, are lesbians. And then it wasn't that, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess. We just accidentally added this porn intro into yeah, this I mean, book. I'm sorry. Look, look, it spilled into my book. Yeah, and I mean, I just thought it was funny because it, it did it did kind of make me laugh and, and, you know, produce that kind of reaction. Obviously, people have different levels of comfort in their friendships. It's fine. If you want to talk about each other's boobs and slap it's each other possible. on the ass, it's fine. I'm not it's saying it's bad. Yeah. I just thought it was kind of odd in the context of the larger book. <laughs> that is all I'm getting yes. at. That's that was also my point. If you like slap at each other's boobs and talk about how nice and ass you got, go for it. Like if you've established that, sure. Oh, all right. Well, now that we've uh, slapped this plot on the ass, what what do you think, Chris? Can we fix it? <laughs> okay. Uh, you, this again. This is our point of disagreement. I feel like we're gonna get in a big fight at the very end of the episode here. Where like it's fine. I think this book is I fine. I chair, give it like a seven out again. of a. <laughs> It's like a seven out of ten, Ooh, maybe. Oh no, that's, no, that's too high. That's probably that's high. my like, but you know, again, it's my warped brain after splattering <laughs> it and during an interview with the devil oh, is like just adding two points <laughs> because yeah, like that's... it's not needlessly gory or makes absolutely no fucking sense. <laughs> I what I mean by seven out of ten is like this is probably enjoyable for the type of person that wants like I just want another World War II spy thriller with like this high society lady flavor. Mm -hmm. And so I I would drop the David and Freddy plot yeah. and sort of make it less about one single social circle. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. It'd be really cool. That that's all I really need. And I would this is fine. I, I think we did forget about one good thing about this is that it did flip perspectives a lot, which is something we both like in books. But Mm -hmm. Again, if it, yeah, not not the same social circle. Um, yeah, I'm gonna agree with you. This can totally be fixed. Cut that like e plot or whatever with David and Freddie because it just feels like total padding and distraction. For the love of the spirit of storytelling, do not make everyone related or in a relationship and conveniently like reunited or near each other. It is so lazy. It makes me hate everything else about your book that's good. 
like if John is going to be alive after all, maybe have him show up like way later or in a more realistic circumstance, for example, and not like conveniently rescued by Maggie's half sister at the same time that Maggie is also in Germany. Um, the whole Frida double cross literally never matters. So why bother? Same, honestly, kind of same thing with the fluoride thing. Like, just come up with something else. Yeah, change up the evil plan yeah. to be a little bit less about diarrhea specifically. <laughs> yeah. um, also, like, don't reward Maggie for her extremely terrible choices. She should have been captured by all accounts, and that would have been more interesting. Like, if she had been captured and had to get out of her way out of that, I that would have been wildly more entertaining to me than, like, oh, Maggie is always fine and she gets out of everything and she always knows who can help her. Yeah, cliffhanger ending, yeah. right? For, to get you to read book four is like now John has escaped, but Maggie's still in there. Like they switch positions. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, there were a lot of little things that would change about this, but yeah, it's totally salvageable. I would, I'd give this, I mean, if we're, if we're doing numerical ratings, I'd give this like a six out of 10. Uh, you know, it, it, it does a lot of the basic stuff, right? Really a lot of effort put into the history part. Um, it's very, uh, quick to read. Um, but it really lost points on like lack of style and imagination, um, and emotional depth or, um, like inventive storytelling. So yeah, that's it for me. Okay. I mean, so at this point we should thank our patrons. Yay, patrons. Thank you, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Arant, Senior, Jakub, like Chorus, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, J, Luchek, Miri, Yanka, David, Julius, Anya, Patricia, Austin, Donnie, Beast with the Least, Scott, Age, Robin, Black Stodies of the Void, the Taco Eating Unicorn, Last Man on Earth, 01, Funny Robot with Antennas, Hobbyboy93, Harry, Mason, Renee, Emmy, The Ugly One, Bleach Black Cat, Julius the Nice Dragon, Eastern Swiss, especially thank you to Eastern Swiss for today's book. Rudy Bo Booty and our Kofi donor Kiwi thing. Thank you so much for supporting the show and for sending us books to read. I mean, yeah, even if they're a little bad. Thank you for sending the books. <laughs> yeah, seriously, uh, Eastern Swiss, thanks so much for sending this in. It was really, it's always really fun to get a package from patrons and to get a book sent to us. Um, and I thought, like Chris said, it was just a perfectly timed recommendation. So we were able to just slot it right into the schedule this year, really round out the terrible book field. You know, now we can say, check check the box we've read the nazi book we've read the world war ii spy thriller we are done all right paris <laughs> well i'm off to do more podcasting in the nude because i have a nude <laughs> podcast that i do everything else yeah with. that's I yeah what you. you all don't know is that we're it's much more comfortable <laughs> we're always nude when we do this uh not just in the summer like we've joked about which is always nude we're always nude it's the only way to like really take care of like non-chafing it's a serious issue so be careful people <laughs> Don't get shaved. It's the only way to podcast. It's the only way you feel like yourself, man. Like, really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later. All right. Uh, have, have, have. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com. <laughs>